Welcome to Summer Fits, the show where Garrett Temple is always worth the price. That's Danny Chow. Hello, that's Justin Barrier. Today we're going to talk about the biggest news of the NBA offseason. Malcolm Brogdon going to the Indiana Pacers. <laughs> Can't wait. Let's go. Danny is, is excited about that one, but we have convinced him to talk about the other big news uh, from Sunday's just bonanza of free agency activity. Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving going right. to the Brooklyn Nets. I don't know if you heard about that one. Yeah, I heard about that one. Guess we'll get a fit off. Well, Malcolm Brogdon, we'll, we'll get to you sometime, buddy. So we're gonna go through where they go from here. We're gonna talk about the available resources they have with Open Up the Books. We're gonna talk about the two paths they can go from here, whether they go all in this year or kind of take it slower and probably kind of target two years down the road, or maybe even three years, depending on how Kevin Durant bounces back from injury. Uh, Danny's gonna take us through how the fit will look on the court, but we're gonna start right up off the top with how these two guys are gonna play together. We're gonna look at it through the prism of where they were last year, Kyrie in Boston, and Kevin Durant in Golden State, and where they will be as Nets. So let's start with Kyrie Irving. Danny, how do you think Kyrie's game changes next to Kevin Durant? I think this is actually really interesting because Kyrie kind of represents the two sides of KD's former point guard partners. Like he is both the isolationist, the soloist of a Russell Westbrook, while kind of taking on the excellent perimeter shooting, as well as you know the, just the, the savvy of, of making plays off the dribble and making plays for himself, getting into the lane and, and scoring around you know traffic like Curry. Um, I think there's a possibility in which Irving kind of reprises his roles in both Cleveland and Boston for this, you know, next stage in his in his NBA career. Do you think that matters whether or not KD is going to be on the floor? Because as we're, we're expecting that Kevin Durant probably won't be there perhaps the entire regular season, if not into the playoffs. So do we see Cavs era Kyrie this season maybe and maybe Boston era later? I think so. I think with the Nets right now, they are so pick and roll oriented and, and they kind of fit players into certain boxes in their system. I think Kyrie's a guy who can definitely transcend that, but it's also a very point guard friendly system. You're asking for a lot of pick and rolls being made, a lot of separation, um, you know, with your big men and with guys who can just, you know, make plays off the dribble and score and shoot. Kyrie's gonna love playing alongside all of these guys because they typically fit what he's try been trying to do for his entire career. Right, and I guess D'Angelo Russell thrived in that role last year. He was an all-star, although gotta fix that asterisk because he was injury replacement in the East. Uh, but I guess, could he just slide into that role for the time being and they just play that similar way with Kyrie as Russell? Yeah, I, I think so. I think Russell ended up spending about 50% of his possessions in the pick and roll. Uh, Kyrie is definitely a guy who, over the past two years with the Celtics, has kind of diversified his diet a little bit. Uh, but I think with this Nets team, you're looking at a guy like Kyrie who can play off ball. He's a good enough shooter, he's a good enough relocator off the ball, he's a smart player. You can get guys like Dinwiddie and Karis LeVert to, you know, take some pressure off of him. Both of those guys are also very good in pick and roll, also very good in isolation basketball. So you're just asking, basically you have this core, a core group of players who can do everything with the ball in their hands. And really that's kind of where the league is trending, right? You wanna have as many of those guys as possible. And they have that and they have Kevin Durant waiting in the wings. Right. That's really scary. Right, they have the best pro possible version of that in Durant. It's funny because in addition to already having Jarrett Allen and picking up DeAndre Jordan, which we'll get to, uh, they have Kevin Durant who, if they want, is probably the best center in the game. Sure, Especially absolutely. in some of those small ball sets. But so I'm really interested to see how Kyrie evolves with KD back in there. Right, yeah, and what we've seen from Kyrie playing alongside you know, LeBron, LeBron was clearly not quite at this stage in his career where you know he's 34, he's kind of trying to, I don't know, wean himself off of doing literally everything. Right. And so back then it was it was a lot of my turn, your turn. And I think one way that Kyrie can kind of show how much he's he's grown over time is by taking some of that Boston sensibility, adding it to what he can do with the Nets with that roster. Um, I think it's an interesting fit. Yeah, 
I mean, I guess Boston was to Kyrie what Golden State was to KD. And so it's interesting that they're both kind of meeting up at this point in their careers. I do wonder uh, how that will both kind of affect them because it seems like Kyrie is a much more diverse player or actually like his, his passing just got way better in that Brad Stevens system. Perhaps he doesn't have a, a fond memory of his time in Boston, but it did seem to enhance the best part of his games already. So I do wonder how Kevin Durant just makes that even better. Yeah, and I, I kind of wonder if, if these two guys who have clearly formed a, a friendship very quickly, have kind of found the Goldilocks version of their running mates. Sure. You know, like, right. like K Katie is basically getting a, a Russ-Steph hybrid in some sorts. And in KD, you have somewhere in between a LeBron and Al Horford okay. kind of guy. Sure. A guy who can do it all, who can play, you know, pretty much every single position, um, can shoot threes, defend, I mean, they're basically looking at, you know, if all goes well, you know, a very, very complementary um, dynamic. So this, that's an interesting question. Which is the better twosome right now? Would it be LeBron and AD or would it be Kyrie and KD? Fully healthy. Fully healthy. LeBron and AD, I, I'm pretty sure. <sighs> I don't know. Because with LeBron, at the very least, you have the limited window, right? Right. But they do play off each other. They, they are perfect complements to mm -hmm. each other. Uh, AD obviously has more experience being a rim protector. KD is a good one, but he just doesn't do it as often. And, and that's kind of where you get into how much that Achilles is going to affect. Him. Right. We just have no idea how he's going to respond laterally, specifically. Um, I mean, we've been watching KD over the years, the past 10 years, you know, develop into a, a fantastic ball handler, a fantastic, you know, guy who can rip the ball from the rim, take the ball down, one man fast break. Can he do that anymore? Right. Or will he at the age of 31, 32, 33 have to really adjust his game? And we, we've kind of seen him adjust his game on the Warriors, um, playing more in the post. And I wonder if that just becomes kind of a full-time uh, transition for him. That's a good place to pick this up because I do think from here there are some interesting questions about the Nets and what they could do in the immediate and also what they could do in the long term. Let's go to opening up the books real quick. Uh, more of an abbreviated version than we usually do here because there really isn't much left to do here. Uh, they're, they're probably going to be over uh, the luxury tax, which is going to limit their options here. They do, unlike most teams in the situation, and specifically unlike the Lakers, who are bereft of much in the way of assets and draft picks going forward, the Nets still have the guts of the team they had last year, essentially, and that includes uh, a lot of draft picks and just flexible contracts. And on the pick front, they, are, they owe a 2020 protected first round pick to Atlanta uh, in the deal that brought them Torrey and Prince in a second max slot. But they're owed a 2020 protected first round pick from Philadelphia. And they have five second round picks coming in and only four going out. So there's still a lot of assets here to do whatever they need to do on the fringes. The contracts are the most interesting point because if you really want to make things happen, those are the type of things that you need because most of the time you see a lot of these teams that just raise their entire roster right. only left with rookie deals. It's essentially what happened with the Lakers where even if they wanted to get a little bit more creative and go for a Bradley Beal, they would have had a tough time matching salaries. Yes, yeah, just don't have the money. But a guy like Spencer Dinwiddie on a three year, $34 million contract, that's a really good deal that a team would be fine taking on because he's still a good player right. and it helps balance out the books. Joe Harris is on one year for, for about $7 million. Garrett Temple is on the room mid-level exception, two years, $10 million. Uh, Rodion Curex, uh, three years, $5.1 million. Did I say that right? Curex? Pretty close. We'll go with that. Uh, and then they have a bunch of rookie deals. Torian Prince, Karis LeVert, Jared Allen. Jean and Musa. <laughs> Jean and Musa. Um, some of those guys, I think Prince and LeVert are both going to be up for extensions going into this season, and so they'll be restricted next summer if they don't do that. But there's a lot of kind of just to work with here. Yeah. I can't think of another team, can you, in recent years that's had this much? Because the Heat, definitely not. They were down to already giving uh, just minimum contracts to rent a bigs and kind of veteran shooters like Mike Miller at that point. Right. Yeah, no, I can't. And I feel like that's exactly why the Knicks contingent of, of the world, the, the fan base out there, are pretty apoplectic. Because it's like right. three years Sean Marks had this team, and he's built a landscape in which they can do whatever the hell they want. Right. It might take three more years for the Knicks to even get back to that point. Exactly. So now the big question here, should the Nets 
go all in for next season when we aren't sure if Kevin Durant is going to play? Or should they kind of target two years down the ro road and really just kind of use this year to figure things out, work Kyrie into the system? Uh, we're gonna go to our next segment. It's called Two Roads Diverge into Christian Wood, which is a really deep cut joke from the Pelican segment that we're gonna keep going forward because it's really Check. funny. Check it out. Check it out and stick with us. All right, for the all-in option, I guess they don't have everything that they need right now. I think sure. they have a lot <laughs> in terms of filling out this roster around KD and Kyrie. Uh, but the two things that I kind of flag here are both defenders and shooters. They didn't get too many great defenders to compliment them. DeAndre Jordan is really just a Fugazi defensive stopper sure. at this point. He was really not stopping anything last season. We'll see if he'll try more uh, now that he has his payday and he's next to his friends in Kyrie and KD. Uh, but the other ones, I mean, Torian Prince is a good 3 and D wing. Garrett Temple, a smart defender. Yeah. And I think all of these guys that they have, uh, as I was saying earlier, how the Nets kind of find pockets where you kind of just fill certain templates of players in, uh, they have their, you know, creator class. They have their 3 and D class and they have their rim runners. Yeah. And I, what I really like about this team is that they have guys like Prince now who kind of fit the mold. Um, they have guys who are versatile, big wings, uh, who can moonlight as small ball fours whenever you know, the time calls for it. Right. Um, yeah, having get, adding guys like Temple to replace guys like Jared Dudley, I think is very smart. You have a bunch of wings who are no shorter than 6'6", six, six, right. being able to kind of slide in wherever they need. Um, I, I think they have a, a very good I think they have a very good kind of infrastructure um, to win right away. Right. It might not be championship caliber, but they will definitely be an improvement over last year, just banking on internal improvement and the fact that Kyrie is a much better player than D'Angelo right now. Right. I guess if you look at the template for super teams over the past couple of years, they always have these same sort of types. Yep. In each one, they have the defensive big, right? They have that three-point marksman, the, the Mike Millers of the world, the Kyle Korvers. Uh, they have the three and D wing, I guess that's Torian Prince. They have the anonymous Euro project who probably won't ever pan out, which is probably the Kyricks, or if they keep Musa. Uh, and they have that kind of hustle wing. They have Fred Van Vliet. I guess that's the Temple. He sure. seems like that type of kind of guy who might swing like two playoff games when you don't expect it. I guess the question is, are those the right guys? And then the question from there is whether or not you want to roll those guys together mm -hmm. and perhaps go for a third star or you want to keep the environment and just go along with what you have right now. Right. So I'm going to put my tinfoil hat on right now and I'm going to say what they could do if they don't want to go the path uh, that they're currently on with this kind of like perfectly constructed sure. uh, depth and yeah. whatnot. What about Bradley Beal though? Mm. So Bradley Beal, probably the next star to be traded on the board here. It seems like he's he's willing to wait and see what's going on with Washington and, and trying to see if they're going to put together a competitive team for next year. I don't know if he's been watching over the past couple days, but it seems like they're taking the opposite direction. Sure. Where they're taking on guys like Mo Wagner and, and kind of getting rid of guys like Thomas Sadoransky. Don't have a point guard currently. They do not have a point guard. Well, I guess he's the point guard, so if he wants to do that, that's wide open for him. But if Beal decides that he wants to get out, there aren't a lot of teams at this point that I could think of that have like just the super duper asset package. I guess right. like a team like the Pelicans get in the mix if they really wanted to, but that would mean kind of moving on from Lonzo and really kind of starting from scratch with Zion and really accelerating the process. Go check out our video on that one. Uh, what if the Nets threw out Karis LeVert, Jared Allen, and Spencer Dinwiddie? for Bradley Beal. And if you really needed to sweeten it, you have all these draft picks. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. That's pretty good. Mainly because the Nets are on this road where they're not gonna be able to pay everyone. And Jared Allen will be up for extension soon. Karis LeVert will be up for extension soon. You know, Torian Prince, all of these guys will be up for big money. And you kind of want to get as much value uh, from them as possible while you still can, while they're still, you know, able to be traded. Right. Yeah, I mean, with DJ, who's definitely not as good of a player as Allen, 
in there, but you probably need to keep him because he seems like he's, he's tight with your two stars now. Maybe you don't need an Allen as much. And while Karis LeVert, a guy who I was very high on, I thought he was better than D'Angelo Russell, and I thought that came to bear in the playoff series where you saw Russell peak at the top and then kind of fall off toward the end, and Karis LeVert was kind of the steady hand for that team. I do wonder like what his role is in the midst of a KD Kyrie team. Perhaps he's just uh, a guy in the wing who can create a little bit, but maybe that's not the best usage for him. You probably right. want more of a spot up shooter. Definitely not, off of him. not as much of a spot up shooter compared to a guy like D'Lo, compared to a guy like Dinwiddie. Um, he's definitely more comfortable kind of creating um, for himself. But yeah, I mean, look, Bradley Beal is by far the best player in this package. And I think when you kind of put it all together, you have Kyrie, Bradley Beal, Joe Harris, you know, <laughs> Torian Prince and, and Kevin Durant as like a, almost like proto, you know, futuristic lineup of death where every single player can shoot at least 39% from three. Uh huh. That's crazy. That's insane spacing. That's great. Uh, I'm in. And I guess the benefit would be if you had just Beal and Kyrie, that's a fun team to just play mm -hmm. out the string with and perhaps make a go of it. I don't think that's an Eastern Conference Finals team, especially if Ka uh, Kawhi comes back, but they're in the mix. Top four? Yeah, I mean, there are not there are a lot of good teams in the East right now. I don't know if there are a lot of great teams. And so that window is open. I think that team is just as good as a Celtics team with like Kemba Walker in there. Absolutely. So I, th I think that would be interesting. Uh, the other side of this would be to wait it out, obviously. And the big part there is just, we don't know when Kevin Durant's gonna come back. We expect him uh, probably to sit out this entire season, but even going into next season, do we know what he's going to be? Right. Is he going to be a diminished version of what he was in Golden State last year? Uh, Kevin Pelton projects that players coming off of Achilles tears tend to drop off 8% in terms of production, which is still an all-star player, perhaps even a superstar level player, but we don't know that. We don't know how he's gonna respond to this. Right. He's basically a seven footer. And so that's a lot of just wear and tear on that leg. I don't know, it's, it's definitely an open question. So do you really wanna put all your eggs into, into kind of making this work immediately when you don't know if your best player is gonna be there? And I guess the case for waiting it out and, and trusting in the core that you've built being kind of augmented by these two superstar pillars. It's just that, look, the Nets were really good last year. They were really fun and, and they showed a lot of promise. And sure, maybe you can't pay all of them, but maybe this is an audition year and you and you kind of see the, the outlines of, of what a team could look like with KD in there. And you pick and choose the guys that you really want on your team. Right. Um, like I was saying, Spencer Dinwiddie and Karis LeVert, two very good isolation players, two very good pick and roll guys that you want on a team built around Kyrie and, and KD. You want as many playmakers as possible. We saw what you know the Warriors looked like without KD and without any of those types of talents, and, and they were dead in the water against the, against the Raptors. Right. All right, so let's take a look at what this team would look like if they did keep the same roster together. Let's go to Danny's play breakdown. Danny, show us what maybe a KD Kyrie partnership would look in practice. This might not actually happen for another two years, but the Nets will probably want to port eventually a few of the Warriors' pet plays once everyone's healthy. Uh, one play that I'm really interested in seeing the Nets personnel bring over is a play actually meant to free Steph Curry for an open three pointer. So here are two plays from last season with the Warriors. It's essentially the same play. Steph Curry moves past two staggered screens, drops the ball off for the five man, who then dumps the ball right to Durant. And right when that entry pass gets to Durant, Steph Curry reverses field, runs all the way back over to the side with Durant, flings it back out to Steph, who is basically like shielded by the five man off a of screen, easy three. And I, I think that is a play that is very much in KD and Kyrie's wheelhouse. I think it's a play that they can exploit very much um, over and over and over again. And it's a play that kind of fits in the Nets sensibility. They set a lot of screens. There are a lot of three pointers being taken. Uh, this is one of those plays where you look at it and you're like, okay, yeah, maybe this is an ideal way to kind of get KD acclimated uh, to playing high-level basketball again. Put him in the post, 
He doesn't necessarily need to shake people off the dribble, but you're still counting on him drawing in so much defensive attention and kind of just making him read the floor and, and, and make the play. So basically, he's in his Dirk phase. Yeah. Which Jonathan Charks wrote about for us at The Ringer. Uh, yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense there. Last year, Kyrie, that couldn't happen because if, if you were putting anybody in that role, it would have been Gordon Hayward. And as we saw many, many times, he wasn't making a lot of those three-pointers or drawing enough defenders away to him in order to kind of open up the space for a Kyrie. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the reason why these plays work and, and the first time, you know, you, get, you see Rudy Gobert kind of lost and Joe Ingles get nailed by Draymond. And in the second play, you see Jokic kind of like wandering out in the wilderness and Jamal Murray getting nailed by a screen. And it just makes sense. Like you can envision Jared Allen or DeAndre Jordan serving as, as the center there. You can see Kevin Durant, you know, exploiting a mismatch in the post. It all kind of is very complimentary of what these two guys can already do. And, and it, is basically a really good example of the types of defensive attention that both of them draw. Right. But for next year, they won't have KD most likely. So let's wrap it up there. We're gonna do a little thumbs up, thumbs down, but we're gonna talk specifically about what happens in year one. This team is definitely going to be in the title conversation, but I do wonder if they're going to be the team that comes out on top here, uh, especially given what the Lakers could put together with Kawhi Leonard. Uh, joining them and, and perhaps making just like a total colossus out in the Western Conference. Uh, Danny, what do you think? Thumbs up, thumbs down about a title in the first year. I can't see it. it like, especially with no Durant, you're, you're basically asking Kyrie and a bunch of kids to kind of take it all the way. I don't, I don't know. Are, are you sold on them even being the favorites out East? Probably not. It really depends on what Kawhi does. Uh, the Bucks pretty much brought everybody back. And no Brogdon, bro. <laughs> no Brogdon. Ah, <laughs> call back. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I, I, so I do think they're probably the favorites if the Raptors take a step back there. I'm not sold on the Sixers. Uh, I do like how they recovered from the Jimmy Butler move. I think Richardson might fit them better than Butler ever did. Yeah, absolutely. But I think that, that kind of huge front court, the monster truck front court they'll have with Al Horford, Tobias, and, and Joel Embiid might be the worst thing possible for Ben Simmons, a guy who you want more at center and more in transition. So I don't know, it, the more I'm talking myself into this, if they get Bradley Beal though, <laughs> yeah, I do think they might have a shot. Mm -hmm. Bradley Beal, uh, Kyrie Irving, and Torian Prince, the big three that you want out there. There it is. So I'm also gonna go thumbs down. <laughs> <laughs> because I think there are a lot of other good teams out there. I, I mean, the Lakers, even without Leonard, even if they fill the rest of the roster out with Team Clutch, mm -hmm. it's still a really good team. Right. So, I don't know. I Actually, I kind of like the Blazers. I kind of like what the Blazers are doing, too. No? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I can't wait to see Hassan Whiteside really get those, get those threes up, you know? It's a revival tour for Hassan Whiteside. Everybody's coming back. All right, we're gonna stop right there. It's a good place to end when you get to Hassan Whiteside. Uh, for Danny, for Justin, we'll be back talking about all the various moves in the off season, if there are any still left to discuss. Uh, <laughs> we will catch you next time. Hey, thanks for watching this YouTube video. For Danny and me, would you do us a favor and click the like button and subscribe and do other things that would help us uh, financially and also support our careers? Thanks. Thank you.